Okay, well, good morning. And this is this morning's sunrise. I thought it was pretty, so I decided to use it as a backdrop. Okay, so let's then move back to um, the lecture. And we've been talking about filtration. Now, as I mentioned, well, much of what we do with filtration spent is really dependent and on hydraulics. The whole design of filtration systems is based on hydraulics. We'll use very little chemistry. Well, we won't use any chemistry in what we do in terms of design here. So what we'll do is we can adjust the surface <clears throat> velocity or the approach velocity by changing the surface area. Now, once we design and construct the filter box, that surface area is fixed and there's nothing we can do in terms of changing that. In terms of the hydraulics, we'll make a number of assumptions and one is we'll assume that the porosity is uniform. So for a particular media, so for instance, for sand, we'll assume that the porosity of the sand is uniform throughout the depth of the bed. The, on the other hand, the grain size distribution will vary. And the range in porosity is relatively small from about 0.45 to 0.55 is what we want for sand and also anthracite. The viscosity <clears throat> and on the other hand, is a function of the water temperature. So <clears throat> as the temperature increases, so as temperature increases, viscosity decreases. And that's important. This will affect the Reynolds number. And we'll use the Reynolds number throughout our design. Now, head loss is extremely critical. I mentioned on Monday that there were two parameters that affect when we backwash a filter. Does anybody remember what they were? So how do we decide when to, when to backwash the filter? Well, what's head loss? Head loss? So if the head loss is too great, we backwash. And what was the other? Turbidity. So if the turb effluent turbidity is too high, then we backwash. So those are the two parameters that we monitor and we monitor continuously in order to determine when to backwash the filter. So the head loss is proportional to, a, to the square of the filtration rate rate or the approach velocity. <clears throat> so small changes in your approach velocity or small changes in your loading will be amplified in terms of the head loss. It's proportional, it's inversely proportional to the diameter of the grain size. So if you decrease the grain size, what happens to head loss? I decrease the grain size. What happens to my head loss? It increases, exactly. It's proportional to the depth of the filter. So if I increase my depth, what happens to the head loss? It increases. Now, let's think about turbidity. So this is essentially re removal efficiency. If I decrease my grain size, what happens to my, the turbidity of in the effluent? So if smaller media size, how does that affect turbidity in my effluent? Okay, just think about this. If I have really small particles versus really big 
particles. So these are my media and I have water flowing. Which one is going to produce a better quality effluent? Or just think if you, the smaller one. So if I decrease my grain size, what happens to the turbidity of my effluent? It goes down, exactly. So I get a better removal efficiency. So if I think about that in terms of removal efficiency, my removal efficiency increases, my water quality is improved. How about with depth? If I increase the depth of my filter, we increase the head loss, but what happens to the turbidity of my effluent? So I have a deeper bed. Can I think about this here? Get this media, get all of this media here versus this media. Then you have a couple layers. Which one's gonna give us a better quality effluent? You're right, it'll decrease. So the turbidity decreases, my removal efficiency increases. And that's true for both when we decrease the grain size okay, and when we increase the depth. So notice this, what we do to decrease our head loss has the opposite effect on our turbidity. So we can decrease our head loss, but we're gonna get poorer quality effluent. When we look at backwashing the filter, and if you missed lecture on Monday, you go back and, look and watch it, especially in terms of the video. I think in order to understand Filtration, it really helps to look at the video. You've got the link to the video. Um, so you can, if you want, just watch the whole thing. There's a number of factors that are important here. So this is the per porosity of the fixed bed. So this is during normal operation. This is the porosity of the expanded bed. So this is during equation. And D sub E is the depth of the expanded bed. So if you think about this, this is our filter. This is our sand. We have the wash troughs above it. And during backwashing, what we will do is we have water flowing in the opposite direction. We will expand this bed. So we fluid, what we do is we'll fluidize the bed so that the water level is just over the top of the trough. The depth of the bed during backwashing, so this now is the sand, this is the, the depth of the bed during backwashing. This is the depth of the bed during operation. So this is D, so this is during operation. And this F is the mass fraction of the filter media with an expanded porosity. And you'll see when we go through the example. And this is dependent on the backwashing velocity. It's dependent on the terminal settling velocity of your particles, so size and density, and Reynolds number. Now, in this figure here, what we've, what's plotted is the turbidity here versus filter runtime and head loss versus filter runtime. This bottom line here is for 
an approach velocity of two gallons per minute per foot square. So that's foot square of surface area. Okay. This bottom here corresponds to the turbidity of that same water. So it's the turbidity in the effluent. The yellow is the head loss for the filter effluent at five gallons per minute per square foot. So increased by a factor of two and a half. And this is the effluent turbidity. So what has happened here? Okay. Things are going along really, really well. It's got a low turbidity, some fluctuations here. The head loss is pretty constant. And then all of a sudden we see this significant increase in the turbidity. So what can be happening here? Why could this have occurred? Number of factors. One, perhaps there was a storm event. There's a slug of um, higher turbidity water moving through the system. The operator didn't notice that, so didn't increase perhaps the coagulant dose or perhaps added either too much or too little chemical dose, but there was some sort of malfunction previously that would have resulted in this increased turbidity. And you can see, not surprisingly, at the higher approach velocity, the impact of that failure is much greater than at a lower approach velocity. Now, this is for a sand filter. As I mentioned, we have single, okay, we have single media and then dual media are the most common types. One of the reasons we use dual media is it's much less susceptible to upsets. It's much more likely that you're going to have this type of a condition in a single media filter. So somebody mentioned bigger particles, okay? Perhaps, okay, bigger particles probably would have gotten stuck on the filter, on the top of the filter. They might have been removed by sieving. Uh, but there are particles definitely moving through the filter. Now, typically, in terms of deciding which of these types, whether to use single or dual media filter, typically, if you're looking at treating groundwater, you can use any of the types. Generally, with a groundwater system, especially if you've got multiple wells, you can blend the water from these wells in order to achieve a relatively constant const <clears throat> um, hardness, which if that's what you're removing into the system. So your water quality is managed by adjusting your flow rate from your wells. You've got some control. Problem with surface water is you have very, very little control. Water can, quality can change rapidly and it, can cha and it changes seasonally. So because of that, with a surface water system, you typically do not want to use a single media system. You'll use dual or multimedia. Um, if the water quality changes slowly, so for instance, this could be a deep intake in a lake, in a large lake. So for instance, the intake for um, <clears throat> Great Lakes Water Authority's um, Port Huron plant, or Fort Gratiot plant, is out in Lake Huron. It's very deep and the water quality is relatively constant. So there they could probably get away with a single media filter. 
On the, on the other hand, if you're treating, Ann Arbor uses a combination of groundwater and lake, uh, sorry, and the Huron River water, the Huron River water is going to change, water quality will fluctuate um, rapidly with storm events, with, it'll change with changing temperature. So a dual or a multimedia system makes more sense there. When we design these filter systems, you will always use an even number of cells. And I'm just gonna skip um, to this. This is a figure, a photo from the Lansing dye water treatment plant. The water flows down the center below the floor level. You then have water flowing to each of the filter banks here. So each one of these here corresponds to a filter bed. Because of the complexity of your pumping system, you will always have an even number of filters. So they're always designed in this way with the main pump down the center and then your filter beds off to, to either side. So you'll always have an even number of filters. Smaller plants, you need a minimum of two. Remember, you need to be able to operate the filter, the entire plant with one filter out of service, one unit out of service. So you wanna be able to ensure that you can operate the system. So when you're designing this, you'll have multiple filter beds, but always an even number. Larger plants, you can, you want a minimum of four and you can use this equation to determine the number of filters. Your filtration rate must be designed for one filter out of service. If your flow rate is too high through the remaining filters, then you can get particle detachment. And remember I said you need both particle at attachment and particle uh, and you want to minimize particle detachment in order to obtain good quality water. So you've always got those two phenomena working against one another. You want to minimize that particle detachment if your flow velocity is too high then you get poor water quality. And you need to remember that in your design. When in the East Lansing wastewater treatment plant, when they designed those filters, the engineers forgot to consider this. And when they have a high flow, so storm event, and they're backwashing a filter, they have to bypass some of the water around the filter because they can't treat it all because somebody forgot to do this set of calculations. Don't be that engineer. The dimensions of these can be anywhere from 25 to 100 square meters. It can be up to 200. <clears throat> square meters, but typically under 100. When you're designing these, this is a filter bed, the whole thing. Either side is your filter cell. So we have two filter cells, the gullet down the middle, and the two together make up a filter bed. So when we say even number, I mean even number of filter beds. <clears throat> this center is the gullet. These are the wash troughs. These are concrete. They can also be metal wash troughs. This is one cell 
this is the other cell. Together, this is your filter bed. It's just a cutaway of the same thing. You can see here's your gullet. You've got the wash troughs here. You have your collection system with all the laterals at the bottom. You have a gravel support. And then you have your sand on top of that and then the water level. This is the an photo of the filter during normal operation. So the water level is high. It's above the top of your water troughs and the water is flowing down in this situation. So you mentioned when backwashing, when the head loss is too great or the turbidity exceeds a, a set limit or you reach a maximum time limit, maximum time limit is three to four days. In some cases, it's backwashing is much more regular than that. And so when that happens, the system is backwashed. This can be done with water only. It can be done with a surface wash. It can be done with air scouring. Um, as I mentioned, this is air scouring is often used with surface waters where you have the clay, the silt particles forming these essentially what we call mud balls. So just kind of think about when you were a kid, you were playing in the mud, how the clay tends to aggregate together. It used to be that the backwash water from a surface water plant could be sent back to the headworks of the plant, but that's no longer the case. This is a photo from the, the dye plant. This is dur during backwashing. So the water is flowing upward through the filter bed. So it's fluidizing the bed and that water is flowing over the sides into the top of the wash trough and <clears throat> into the wash trough and then to the gullet. And then in this case, this is a surf, this is a groundwater plant. Because it's a groundwater plant, they are able to recycle this water to the headworks of the plant in order to capture that calcium carbonate precipitate again. So it basically goes through the whole plant all over again, try and capture it a second or third time and also to use the excess calcium <clears throat> uh, hydroxide in there to help raise the pH. So it helps reduce the dosage of lime that they need to add. So in this, in this situation, because it's a groundwater plant, they're able to do that. This is another photo from the operation of the plant. What I'd like to do now is we're going to go through an example. This will take the rest of today and on Friday. Um, what I'm hoping to do is we'll get through the head loss calculations for a clean filter bed. So the question is, are the wash troughs serving the purpose of increasing the backwashing efficiency? The wash troughs are really capturing the water. So you need, as you're backwashing that um, filter, you need to be able to capture that water. And the wash troughs is ba are basically your collection device. So we have a situation. Okay. We're installing rapid sand filters. Good sedimentation and then filtration. In this case, you're told that you have a design loading rate of 200 meters cubed per minute. Decrease the size. Okay, that's good. Okay. We have a design flow rate 
of 0.5 cubic meters per second, you're told that the maximum surface area of the, of the filters is to be 100 square meters, but the desired area is 50. And what we initially are looking to do is to calculate the clean filter bed head loss and determine if it's reasonable. We want that head loss less than 0.6 meters. We'll use the following assumptions we have provided <clears throat> some data on the sand. We're told that the specific gravity of the sand is 2.65. <clears throat> we have a shape factor of 0.82. The bed porosity is 0.45. <clears throat> We're designing this for a temperature of 10 degrees C and the depth of our sand is 0.5 meters. This information here would be provided from the manufacturer. So what we have is we have the sieve size designation, we have the size of the opening, and we have a cumulative mass passing. Now, the CLUM standards state that the recs recommended maximum filtration rates, that's B sub A, is 360 meters per day for dual meter, media, media, media filter, and 180 for a <clears throat> single media. The problem states 0.5 meters of sand, so we're gonna assume we have a single media. So even though you're told here that your design loading rate is 200, we're gonna make the decision as the engineer that we really wanna reduce that to 180 to comply with the GLOM standards. This is an iterative process. And you'll need to think about it as such. And my advice is to set up the, an Excel spreadsheet to allow you to iterate on a solution without having to go through multiple calculations by hand multiple times. And you'll definitely need to do this for the design project. So my advice is do it for the filtration homework and then you have that same Excel spreadsheet for your design project. So let's just start. And we're going to start with the, got this equation here for the surface area. And we're going to pretend we didn't look at that initially. You just followed what the design engineer or what the specification said. So let's just initially look at that using the 200 meters cubed per day, day per meter squared or meters per day. And that would give us 216. In this case, the number of filters is equal to 216 meters squared. Set the pref preferred filters that are 50 square meters. And that gives me 4.32 filters. I can't have 4.32 filters. So what do I do? What are my options? I can increase the size or I can increase the number. Increasing the number of filters means that you're increasing the, or increasing the complexity of your plumbing system. Okay. So we've got to round up or round down. Okay. We're already at the maximum, so round down would be a problem. So we can look at using six. So let's look at using six. 
if we use six filters and we keep our <clears throat> filter size at 50 square meters, square meters, and we have six, that gives me an approach velocity of 144 meters per day. That checks. What if I have one filter out of service? So now I only have five in service. That's 172 meters cubed per meter squared per day, which also checks out. So I can use six filters at 50 square meters. I'm perfectly fine in terms of that approach velocity. It's less than that 180. That's less than 180. This is also less than 180. So we're good. Now, we could also try, can we achieve a approach velocity of less than 180 with only four filters. And I have four filters, but I increase the size to 80 square meters. That corresponds to an approach velocity of 135 meters per day. And then with one filter at a service, I would have an approach velocity of 180 meters per day. So either situation is acceptable and it most likely would come down to cost. Cost and space availability. If we increase the, size, the number of filters, it's more space. It's also more valving. It's more monitoring that we need to do. So it's more monitors that we have. So there's a cost associated with that. The next thing we wanna do is to calculate the head loss of the clean filter bed. So we're gonna use this the equation that I've given you now. Here, it's the same equation in the notes. Again, it's an empirical equation and the head loss is a function of your velocity, approach velocity squared, the depth of your bed. It's inversely proportional to the spherosity, the porosity, and the diameter of your media. We need to check the effective size and the uniformity coefficient. The effective size is that D10 and the uniformity coefficient is D60 over D10. So what I've done here is I've plotted the data that we <clears throat> were provided as the sieve size this is millimeters, so this is looking back to here. That's this sieve size here versus the cumulative mass passing. And I've pl plotted that on log probability paper. So each one of these is a point. And what we need to calculate is this D10 right here. So this corresponds to my D10 and then the D60 is up here. So this is my D60. And the effective size is 0.3. My P60 is right here. 
is equal to 0.82. And this would give me an effective, <clears throat> sorry, uniformity coefficient of 0.82 divided by 0.3, and that is 2.73. This value should be between 1.3 to 1.8, and the GLUM standards state that it should be less than or equal to 1.65. Basically, so it's more uniform. What do I do now? I'd have to go back to the company, the supplier of the sand, and say that I need a sand that meets this criteria. So for your design project, there is a company, Red Flint. They're located in Minnesota, I believe. Minnesota or Wisconsin, I forget which now. Um, they have the type of information that we need available on their website. So what you'll be doing for further aspect of your mini design is you will be using the data available from Red Flint to choose a sand that will meet this criteria. We're gonna move forward with this. Um, this corresponds to the example in the textbook, but in reality and in your design project, you'll pick the sand and you want a sand that meets these requirements. So the next thing we'll do is we want to reorganize the data. So what we're looking at is the percent retained between two sieve sizes. So if you look here, this 2.2 is 99.2 zero minus 96.8. So what we were given was the cumulative mass passing. And if we go back to this information here, we're looking at the percent retained in this fraction right here, in the sieve size six to, <clears throat> to eight. So that gives us this value right here. This 5.3 comes from, we'll look at the next, we'll look at eight to 12. And that's 6.8 minus 91.5, and that's 5.3. So these are percent. We need to calculate the geometric mean of your particle size. So here, what you're looking at is the mesh size, 3.36 millimeters times 2.38. So this is the mesh sizes of the six and the eight sieves. We'll multiply those and take the square root. That's the geometric mean. So that's so my geometric mean diameter between the, the sieve size six and eight is two point eight two seven nine. The geometric mean for the between the eight and the twelve is 2.38 times 1.68. And we take the square root of that, and that is 1.9996 millimeters. So that gives us <clears throat> the geometric mean. The next thing we want to do is to calculate the approach velocity. So we'll use, we'll go back here, we're going to use this situation. We've chosen, we've, just, let's, we've decided that we're going to design the system with four filters at 80 square meters. 
So we'll use an approach velocity of 135 meters per day, but we need this in meters per second. So we'll divide 86,400 seconds per day. And that is 0 0.001563 meters per second. You're told that the shape factor or the sphericity is 0.82. The kinematic viscosity is 1.307 times 10 to the minus six meters squared per second at 10 degrees C. And then D is the geometric mean. I'm gonna stop there. My advice between now and Friday is you try and calculate these values. And then what we'll do is we'll proceed through here and then we'll calculate the head loss of the clean filter bed. Okay, so let's stop here. Um, for the rent, Reynolds number, what happened to the rest of the factors? This is the same Reynolds number that we used before. Um, so I'm not sure, not sure the question. What factors? Oh yeah, um, it only has VA on the top. So I was wondering what happened to like the shape factor. So this is actually, the shape factor is actually included in here. Oh, so okay. Get this value here, it's 0.82 times 1.996 times 10 to the minus three meters. We'll go over this on Friday. One times 1.56 times 10 to the minus three meters per second divided by the viscosity. So it's all included, it's included in this value here. So this is the, <clears throat> to get this value here, I'm substituting in the, this whole equation here. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. No problem. Okay, well, good morning.